So, welcome everybody. Um, so today's uh, seminar is a bit special because we are connecting to Oberwolfach, and so you see the audience in the room, but the audience for now is muted, just in case. I cannot control that. In any case, it's my special pleasure to have John Maddox speaking today, um, who will talk about ideal knots, the trefoil analysis, and numerics to experiment. Okay, thank you very much. So um, I uh, like to be unconventional. So it's evening here. So I recommend everybody get something to drink, <laughs> help things along. This is beer, but it's non-alcoholic beer. Actually, it's a very, it's a very good non-alcoholic beer, but anyway. Okay, so um, I believe this is a general sort of analysis colloquium because the conference has a bunch of specialists. So to the specialists, I'm gonna repeat stuff you surely know but I'm gonna give a, a little bit more uh, background like that. And so actually I, uh, I found a happier phrasing of the title, the tightest trefoil from analysis through computation to experiment. And there we go. Uh, okay, and that's interesting because now, okay, there's the first problem. Why is my, okay, we didn't check that. My uh, pay, Okay, my keys don't work. That's weird. Okay, but my mouse does. Right. So, um, so it's always good to have a take-home message uh, from um, uh, a talk. And my take-home message is going to be: I'm going to start a timer, so I know where the hell I am. Uh, but the other matter is the take-home thing is it's all about contact sets. So the goal of the talk is what a contact set is should make some sense come the end. And you may or may not agree with me uh, uh, whether it makes any sense. Okay, so this is an, a geometric analysis uh, seminar, as I understand it. And in fact, I hold a chair at the, uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology at Lausanne, and the name of the chair is Analyse Applique. So literally, the translation of that is applied analysis. But in point of fact, in the French context or in the Swiss French context, it really means applied math. So I'm basically not an analyst. So sorry about that. Hopefully I'll say something of interesting to some people who, of the analysts. But I tend to like to work on really, in it, I like to work on um, physic, physical problems, not necessarily applied in the sense that you make money or whatever, but I like, I enjoy using mathematics to try and understand some form of physics. So, uh, uh, and this picture right here, you can't see my zoom controls, right? No, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. I just have to put them out of the way for me then, right? So this picture is why I started working on these, these their so-called ideal knot shapes, things like that. And so on the horizontal here, that's a picture of a gel. And so if you go into any microbiology lab, the standard things they do is they run things on electrophoretic gels. And so they dump a bunch of radioactive stuff there. In this case, it's DNA. It's DNA is charged. They put it in an electric field and the different kinds of DNA runs at different speeds. So these bands are where the different bits of DNA show up. And then this group, um, uh, uh, so Andre Stasiak was the guy we talked to most of. Uh, this is also the group of Jacques Dubochet, who I guess two years ago now uh, won the Nobel Prize for uh, cryo-electron microscopy. And so the thing is they can cut out these bands and then they can look at the DNA in each band and they uh, can then figure out it, it, it's made to have knots. It, knots don't arise so frequently in nature in DNA but they can make them this way. And there's been big programs funded by the US National Science Foundation about topology and, but anyway, I go too far abroad. So that's what, that's that axis. And this axis is something called average crossing number, which I'm not even going to define. Mm -hmm. But the point is that the average crossing number doesn't depend just on the topology of a knot. It depends on the shape of a knot. 
and the data it now is, so, the, uh, so this is the unknot, which is there, so that's just a closed circle. There's actually some junk linear DNA in the experimental data, so then you ignore that. So then there's a 3-1 knot, which is a trefoil, a 4-1 knot, which is a figure eight, 5-1 and a 5-2, 6 one, okay. So these numbers are basically the Tate knot tables. And those are the, it's the numbers of knots of, of different crossing numbers. And, uh, but the thing is then you've got this beautiful linear relationship. And so he said, you know, so what is going on? And so that's data that was published in 1996 in Nature by this group. And then actually Andre Stasiak showed us this data one day. Uh, and uh, that's what launched the stuff I'm gonna to describe to you uh, in this talk. Uh, okay, so that's fine. And now I go to the next one. So the Tate knot tables like that. So there's a representative geometry of each knot topology. So Tate just sort of picked nice things you could draw in a book, right? And so they're planar and they're, um, uh, but with the addition of over and under crossings. So then you can figure out the knot type as drawn in a page. But then ideal shapes uh, provide, they're sort of three dimensional canonical geometries of each knot type. And I'm not going to, I mean, well, I mean, uh, so the guys in the US, it's lunchtime, you're primed up to work. We're all going to sleep in Europe. So I'm not gonna define precisely what it is. So, so this is a picture, this is a trefoil knot, and you'll be pretty sick of this picture by the time we get to the end of the talk. Well, that's supposedly, it's the tightest, some people will call it the tightest shape or the ideal shape of a closed trefoil knot. So we're mathematicians, so you see, if you say not to uh, most people in the world, it has two ends, right? But for mathematicians, knots are in closed loops and anything that's not in a closer. So this is a closed trefoil knot. But the idea is uh, what you do is you imagine that that gold thing, that gold tube is a rope and you've got a fixed diameter. And then you ask, what is the shortest length of rope where I can tie the knot and then stick the ends together and still make it? So this is called sometimes called rope length. And uh, now it's apparent uh, as soon as you think about it for more than three seconds is this it's scale invariant in, uh, in R3. So it's the ratio of the length to the diameter or the length to the radius of the rope that matters. I mean, and so there's no actual length but it's always the ratio like that. So in principle, there's at least two ways mathematically you can define this. You can prescribe the diameter and then try and find the shortest length. Or you could say you could prescribe the arc length and then get the largest diameter and try and like you can imagine inflating it, right? Something like that. Okay, so that's the problem. And uh, hopefully that now makes sense. Now, so I came to it because we wanted to try and understand the sedimentation data that I showed you. So the average crossing number, it's some number, it's related to ride, blah, 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 it doesn't really matter, but it may, depends on the shape. And the point was that linear plot, um, it, it's saying that the, these ideal knot shapes were the things that had a, a linear relation with the gel speeds. So now, alas, it basically seems like it's an accident. So for example, um, uh, Stokes flow is, it's, you know, it's very viscous uh, uh, liquid flow. And so there's different models of computing a drag matrix. One of the standard ones is Rotney Prager. If you use the Rotney Prager model to compute the drag on a filament, the numerics would suggest the ideal shapes are close to, but are not equal to the maximal drag shapes of various knot types. And so you see, it's sort of tempting to think that if you have a flexible object and you're pulling it through a fluid, then it will try and arrange to minimize the drag. So given that parachutists are on the whole still alive, they know it's the opposite. I mean, the parachute opens out to maximize the drag. So the thought was that these ideal knot shapes, which were the furthest away from each other for a given length, maximized the drag. And that's why you got these things. It turns out it's not, it's not actually true. Uh, it, it, it's close to true, but I mean, it's, it's just not, still not clear what's going on. But the point about this is that these are these ideal shapes, which I described to you as being very tight, but they still have to do with physics. 
and the, the DNA knots on those experiments are far from tight. I mean, the diameter of the DNA is tiny compared to its length, but the idea is the shape is, it's somehow, it's a maximum volume shape curve and various people, I mean, there's, these have come up in statistical mechanics and probability of finding knots and stuff like that, but that's okay. But then um, that's all right. So then, uh, so it doesn't work. So uh, if I'm an applied mathematician, I should stop working on it then. But of course, I also have a little bit of mathemat mathematician in it. And they're just ideal knot shapes. They're very interesting and it's a purely geometric problem. And in particular, if you're actually at the, uh, uh, the conference, uh, is strongly biased to people who like ideal knot shapes. <clears throat> so I'm going to describe to you next something called the global radius of curvature, which a guy called Oscar Gonzalez and I did in 99. And it can be used to really prove that ideal shapes exist. So now, of course, you talk to somebody in DNA, he says, what do you mean? I tied a knot, of course it exists. But the, the point is ideal knot shapes are C11. And that's, of course, then that's important for how you compute it. And in fact, there's a series of three articles which uh, in very close timing together uh, did this. So I'm not, I mean, I'll give you a, just a flavor of the idea of how you prove that. But then, uh, um, then I'll also show how you compute things. And so for the, those of you who came a few minutes early, I was spinning a cool looking surface. This is to do with ideal knot shapes. I'll explain a little bit of the computation. Um, and uh, that's right, but the, the computations, they're difficult. And they're difficult precisely because there's non-local interactions. So um, uh, the, the notion that there's a set of equations relating to the first order necessary conditions and you solve those numerically is um, I think still not quite there yet. Uh, and so most of, the, most of the computations I've known and the computations I'm gonna show you today are Monte Carlo and simulated annealing. They're just basically trial and error like that. Okay, so then I can't do that, but there we go. Okay, so what's this global of radius of curvature uh, idea and why is it necessary? So what's the problem? So the point is for two curves, there are no, there is no problem. So for two non-intersecting smooth curves, Q1 and Q2, so then the distance between a point S and a point sigma, and then we make this mapping. These are the arc lengths and those are the vectors, right? So we're gonna define the distance between a point Q1 and a point Q2 on the second curve uh, and, um, I'm a strange person. So instead of taking the, the norm, I'm gonna put a half in front of it, why not? And then this notation PP is gonna come back, it's because it's a point point distance, which you will also come back to, right? So that's what I say. And so then you ask yourself, okay, so where can the minimizers of this function come? So it's a simple computation. You've probably done it in various calculus classes. The minimizer of that function is achieved at doubly critical uh, pairs of points. So in particular, you get Q1 on the first curve, Q2 on the second curve, and you have the construction that there's a chord between them there. And moreover, the tangent at Q2 is perpendicular to the chord and the tangent at Q1 is perpendicular to the chord. So these are these doubly critical pairs of points. Now it is not, actually this is not such a good figure. In this figure, it looks as though this tangent is perpendicular to that tangent and there's no necessity why that should be. But now let, now let me say uh, something a little bit strange. So what's special about these doubly critical chords? So the one thing that's special about these doubly critical chords is you can fit in a sphere which passes through Q1, passes through Q2 and the curve at Q2 is tangent to the sphere and the curve at Q1 is tangent to the sphere, right? And the diameter of the sphere is the length of the chord, which is sort of a clue why there's a half, but we'll get there. But basically there's no, if you're considering the distance between two curves, uh, there's just not, there's no reason to introduce global race of curvature. Now, then the point now is for these two curves then, once you've got a point, once you've got the point of closest approach, you can then just inflate a tube 
uniformly around the two curves, and then you get a shape. You get a yellow shape and a green shape, and they'll touch in that one point, right? And they don't touch anywhere else, right? So that's good. Uh, all right. But the whole point is that if you then, for ideal knots, there's only one curve. And in particular then, so for ideal knots, you have to look at the minimum of PP, S, and sigma. But I said there's no proofs. I'll prove this theorem. The minimum of that is zero because it's when S equals sigma. Right? So boring, no information, right? And it's just useless. So you want to ask the question, what's the largest non-self-intersecting uniform tube with a circular cross section that can be inflated about a given curve as a center line, right? And, and this, this somehow standard distance just doesn't help. Well, it helps a bit, right? Okay, so that's a classic question. And the classic way to really answer it is the normal injectivity radius. So, uh, and in particular, if a curve is uh, C1 and piecewise C2, the thickness or the normal is achieved by either. So this is now, a, a, this is like a period three unknot. And so you inflate things and the largest radius might be when you get close by cross sections intersecting. And that's saying that the local radius of curvature is equal to the thickness, right? Or you could have like this figure eight guy and then the, the then you'll actually get a core, uh, a doubly critical chord over there. And so, and I happened, these two examples happen to be both closed and unknotted, right? But now the, so now the idea is of global radius of curvature is that you define the thickness. This is now a scalar number of a, clo of a simple closed curve, okay? And what you do is you take a uh, three point, ah, ah, Sorry, yes. You take three points somewhere on the curve, they define a unique circle. Might be a straight line, right? But three distinct points always give you a unique circle, possibly a straight line. And then that defines a radius function, R of X, Y, and Z. And so now uh, that's fine. So that's the R. And you define the thickness of the curve to be the infimum over all three such values, right? And now the point now is, <coughs> if you get to a doubly critical chord, this number corresponds to half the pairwise distance because you can insert a circle, right? And the circle's tangent at one end and it goes through the other one. But now the point is then if the three points coalesce, that's exactly the oscillating circle. So the, along the diagonal, things don't go to zero, they go to the radius of curvature and like that, okay. So uh, that's right. And so in fact, uh, now uh, there's quite a, a literature. People call this thing the, the Menger curvature of those three points. Okay, All right. So now uh, it turns out this, but, but the thing I'm gonna talk about uh, is if you like, it's Menger curvature is through three points, but then I'm gonna minimize or take the infimum over some number of those arguments, possibly three, possibly two, possibly one. So the functional, this functional, this, thick, this thickness of a curve is well-defined for arc length parameterized, closed. So you just need to be slightly better than uh, uh, continuous. And then if you impose a lower bound, right? So I'm gonna consider C01 curves for which there is a, a, a lower bound on this infimum, okay? So the interesting thing is, uh, See, I mean, philosophically, this is almost saying the curve is C2. I mean, you're, you're saying, let's take a C01 curve, uh, which is twice differentiable, but we're not doing that. We're saying C01 curve with a lower bound on these circles. So then you can actually prove that that curve is differentiable and the tangent curve is Lipschitz and the Lipschitz constant is this guy, right? So in other words, if you start from any closed arc length parameterized Lipschitz continuous curves with a positive thickness, they're actually C11 curves, right? And therefore their curvature exists almost everywhere. But the real magic thing is that that bound is weakly closed in W1P for P bigger than one. And so you can combine that with direct methods of the calculus of variations to prove existence. And so, uh, and it's really like saying, 
uh, you know, of course, the second derivative wouldn't be weakly closed. So it's a it's a weakly closed version, which is somehow saying things about higher derivatives. And now, I guess it's I think everyone agrees now. Probably before uh, uh, global rays of curvature, C one one's the natural smoothness of fatten curves, self avoiding curves. Right. So that was made in this article, and then we used it to prove existence. We used it in particular to prove existence of uh, various elastic rod energies. So like in the Oberwolfach conference, people are modeling self-avoiding rods and stuff like this. So the thing is this article 2002, you already get existence of minimizers for a wide, wide class of energies. But this talk is about the ideal or tightest shape. And that's just a special case of what we prove for existence. And that's actually where the energy is the arc length. So this is the statement. So then the lower bound is saying that's the, um, well, actually it's the radius of the tube. You fix a lower bound on the radius of the tube and then you minimize the arc length and that's it. Okay, but I mean, I'm not gonna go that, right. Okay, so then uh, that's fine. So that was a number, which was the thickness of a curve. But then you can also introduce a global radius of curvature function by not minimizing or I think I'll say minimizing, but of course they're always in infimum. I'm not sure I can say infimizing, minimizing I'll say. So you now define a function of S by minimizing over two of the arguments. So then you fix one point and you minimize over the other two, right? And so um, we've evolved. So originally we called it rho G of S and that was motivated by the fact that if sigma and tau go to S, then you get the classic oscillating circle as a competitor. I mean, if it's C2, it is the value of the things like that. But then we realized then that we maybe also want to talk about these PPP. So PPPP, three P's means three points, right? Okay. And so we have these slightly different notations, but that's fine. And there we go. But then, uh, okay. And so then, yeah, so then we did these thickness. But now the crucial point, the, I mean, the real payoff for this global radius of curvature is it's defined by a circle. So you can always, can, whenever you have a circle, you also have a sphere and you take the sphere, which has the given circle as its uh, uh, equator, right? So what you can do is just by very elementary uh, arguments and in particular, a closed curve uh, goes in and out of a sphere an even number of times, right? And so you can, by simple arguments with spheres and crossings, you can say that the, uh, this thickness is never achieved by three distinct arguments. And so it's always achieved, uh, I mean, it can be achieved by three coalescent arguments, but uh, it can also be achieved by uh, one, dis ah, one distinct argument and two coalescent ones. And that's basically then saying, if you take two points which coalesce, you're taking the circle through a point that's through a second point and it has a prescribed tangent. And so uh, this then leads you to this. So this is the PT function. So that's a point tangent. So it's, it's through the point at S and it's through the point and with the prescribed tangent at sigma. And that's why this notation. So PPPP collapses as sigma and tau coalesce, goes to PT. You could also do TP and various other, uh, okay. So then this defines it. And for computation, that's incredibly, you know, because obviously, I mean, if you're actually evaluating the thickness, if you have a mesh, that's N cubed. If you want to, for some reason, want to compute this function, that's still a quadratic search for every S, but now you don't have to do that anymore. It's just a linear search. It's still not so great. It's not a pointwise function. You have to minimize over the curve, but it's only a linear search. And so that's one of the nice things about these spheres. And so now you could ask, okay, there's not so, I mean, so what's known about these ideal shapes? So there's C11, you can prove it that way, da 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 da, right, uh, okay. So uh, it is known that for the unknot, the ideal shape is the circle. I don't actually know who proved that first. Um, that could probably predate ideal knot shapes. I'd be curious if somebody knows that. Um, there's other uh, known shapes 
which are known to be ideal, but they're only for certain links. And all of them have the property that they're piecewise planar. Uh, so Stariston uh, essentially got a, 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 what's explicit is sometimes a little bit subjective. Stariston solved ordinary differential equations, which gave you uh, it's something called the orthogonal link. Uh, Kuzner, Sullivan, Cantarella, I may have forgotten other people, they proved things for various links. So the Hopf link, it's two perpendicular circles are known to be ideal. Uh, there's other thing, right? Okay, good. So now, um, uh, but what that means is, but there's no, there's unless somebody has done it and I don't know about it, which I think is not likely, there's no known, analytically known ideal shape uh, for a, a non-trivial knot. So that would be say, okay, so you're going to do numerics, but then you want to test how good is the numerics? So you might want to say, okay, how good are, I mean, are there first order necessary conditions? Are there oil Lagrange equations? And in fact, that's one of the big topics of this conference. Um, uh, and it depends on what the energy is, of course. Um, one thing I showed with Oscar Gonzalez is this global range of curvature function has to be constant and minimal along any ideal shape or there is a local straight segment, right? And that or is real. So for example, there's composite knots. There's a, a composite trefoil knot. I mean, a, a left-handed trefoil attached to a right-handed trefoil. Numerics, I mean, it's not a proof. Numerics are really quite convincing that there are straight segments. So in particular, that really does mean that um, the curves are, are well, uh, no better, that they're not C2. I mean, almost surely there are ideal shapes which are not C2. I mean, they are C11. Actually, I'd say that my conjecture would be ideal shapes are piecewise, uh, probably C infinity, uh, but with jumps in curvature, right? And so there'd be isolated jumps. I mean, maybe there's kind of weird cases, but that seems to be that's sort of the result you'd like to be going to, but as far as I know, no one's proved that, at least not for tight knots. Um, there's actually a more refined necessary condition, and that's somehow related to force balance in a string that roughly speaking says the principal normal to the, the center line of the knot lies in the cone spanned by all contact cords. And that was derived by uh, Friedem and Schurecht and Heiko von der Mosel, right? And so I'm not gonna, I mean, there's, there's uh, the serious hypotheses, right? Okay, but uh, if you're interested, go look. And there's people at the conference who know more about it than me, for example, Heiko von der Mosel. But anyway, okay, so, but I'm gonna move on to numerical computations. Uh, okay, so now, um, uh, and I'm now gonna show you reasonably accurate numerical approximations and related visualizations that are sort of by me, actually I forgot to put in Oscar Gonzalez. Uh, by me, Oscar Gonzalez, there was a student, Jana Smutny, another, two other students, um, Matthias Carlin and Henrik Gerlach. Oh, look at that. Ben Laurie got in twice and Oscar didn't get in once. Oops, <laughs> never mind. Uh, right, uh, right. But then they exploit a C11 by arc spline combined with simulated annealing. And the point I want to say is that I'm gonna show you features of those uh, uh, that arise for the trefoil case. And they're gonna be features that all arise in the contact set. And this is what I strongly believe is if you want to understand these ideal knot shapes, it's all about understanding the contact set. So now these are all quite old computations. And um, I can't remember whether I said this or not. I mean, this talk, probably the first two thirds of it is probably all approaching 10 years old. I apologize if anyone has seen it before and remembered any of it. Those are two separate issues, right? But then the most recent stuff is like 10 days ago, never mind 10 years ago. But the point is these simulations of the ideal trefoil certainly aren't the best ones now. And in fact, there's a simulation by Przybyl and Peransky, and that's probably the most accurate uh, computation of the, the ideal trefoil that's available now. But happily, all those computations did is they confirmed the features that I'm gonna to describe to you 
on the less converged simulations. Okay, but now um, again, it's a, I'm slightly hybrid because there's this conference and then it's a colloquium for more general things. So there's been, uh, I guess, at least two, if not three or four talks about using finite element methods uh, to compute um, uh, ideal knot shapes according or energy minimizers, optimal knot shapes. And so now uh, the, the, so these are one space dimension problems so far. In fact, I'm gonna show you at the end finite element methods, which are in three dimensions, but we wait for that. But the standard then thing to do is to use uh, some kind of splines. So the standard finite element method would have cubic splines or whatever degree value of splines. And one of the, you know, you can do H convergence and P convergence and whatever. But now uh, what I believe actually is for ideal knot computations, you shouldn't use polynomial splines. There's these things called biarcs, and they are just like, they're like optimally designed for this computation. And so I'd like to explain to you what biarcs are. Now biarcs, actually, they, um, uh, there exists in old literature, but they've never really taken off. And so here's the point. So the basic data now would be a point Q1 and a tangent direction at Q1 and a point Q0 and a tangent direction uh, T0, okay? So then uh, uh, two points and two tangents, they describe a sphere. Right. So that's a unique sphere. And in that surface of the sphere, you can consider circles that go through this point and are tangent. And then if you pick the radius right, you'll end up going through Q1. However, you won't hit the right tangent direction at Q1 unless you're very lucky. But what you can do with, with bi arcs is you can take two arcs of circles and you have a matching point so this circle goes through Q0, is tangent to this prescribed T0. This arc is through Q1 and is tangent to that T1. And it turns out there's a one parameter family of those pairs that join up in a C1 way in the middle. And they all lie on that sphere and they just have like gorgeous properties. So I wanted to take a little time to tell you about those. So why bi arcs? Well, ideal shapes exist in the space C11. Bi arcs are C11. Um, in fact, uh, I should say lots of people have used piecewise linear discretization. And in some sense, of course, you know, you take more and more piecewise linears and there's some convergence, but ultimately they're in the wrong class because piecewise linear is not C11, there's corners, right? Uh, now you can fix it. And in particular, Eric Rawdon has beautiful methods of inscribing arcs of circles into piecewise polygons. And this can all, this objection can be overruled. But uh, I claim, why bother? Why not just start with bi arcs? But the main thing is about bi arc or a, a reservation for cubic spline is there's no closed form expression for arc length. I mean, you could do it by quadrature, but if you don't have arc length, there's no closed form expression for torsion, uh, sorry, for curvature, never mind torsion. And of course, you can numerically approximate all these things. But the point is for bi arcs, you don't need to. I mean, they're arcs of circles. So, so I mean, you know the length, <laughs> you know the curvature, and you even know the torsion because the torsion is localized delta functions. It's just the angle between the planes of the circles. And they're just beautiful. You can tell them I like that. <clears throat> so a bi arc curve is just a bunch of bi arcs. And I guess it's like a hermite, hermite interpolation. You have point tangent data. And instead of interpolating with a cubic spline, you interpolate with bi arcs. So arc length, local curvature, da da da. The other <clears throat> really interesting thing is that you can now do this. <clears throat> well, I mean, I'm also a big fan of. Uh, global radius of curvature. So you have to do this big search, right? You have to find the minimizers. So now uh, if you have straight line segments, you know, you can do a lot of tricks. You know where the critical chords are and stuff. And I guess everybody knows that. The interesting thing is basically the similar tricks for arcs of circles. And you can do subdivision, you get really efficient algorithms <coughs> for computing the, the 
uh, uh, these, this function rho pt. So you can compute rho pt very quickly on a Biart curve. And I do not, I repeat, do not mean evaluating just at the node points. I mean, you can evaluate it anywhere you like really quickly. And I don't know that you can do that with splines uh, so easily. It's a little bit dangerous. I don't want it to work. I haven't, can't say I've tried so hard. But these bi arcs are just really suitable uh, for these computations. <coughs> um, this student, Jana Smutny, I mean, she also proved that there's convergence results. So let me, uh, it's in the evening, uh, even if my beer is non-alcoholic, I don't want to go through that theorem. But this is basically, it's the same convergence theorem as you'd get for cubic spines. Right, so this interpolate, I mean, it's approximation results for families of bi arcs. And, you know, if the curve is C1, you get convergence in C, you get convergence of the derivative, you get convergence of the curvatures, depending on how the, how smooth the underlying curve is. And they're, I mean, they're really nice convergence results. Right, and so I guess I got out of order, I already said that. The most thing about having this bi arc discretization, there's basically, it's kind of a flavor of a, of a computer science trick. You can evaluate this rho pt function very, very quickly. And, and remember this rho pt function is a minimizing over all points on the curve. So I mean, every time you want to evaluate rho pt at a point, you have to do a 1D search along the curve. But I mean, it, they're very, very fast. And then the final thing is people say, so why have I never heard of bi arcs? And my claim is you have, because there's books on NURBS, non-uniform rational B splines. And it turns out that uh, bi arcs are a particular class of NURBS. And uh, I really don't understand why they're not used more. So there's a sales pitch. So I'm now an old fuddy-duddy and I tell people what to do. Okay, good. So here we go. Visualizations of the ideal shape of a trefoil. So there's that same gold tube. You can tell it's accurate because you can see the pixels. It's a crappy picture. So now we start to live dangerously. Do we start to live dangerously? Oh, wow, that's slow. Uh, okay, so here's now is this guy. And in fact, I shouldn't have left this like that. Uh, where am I? Uh, oh, there we go. Actually, I've spoiled the story because I should have shown it to you like that. So this is the analog in red of the gold surface. So this is a, 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 a visualization of a, of a tube computed with bi arcs. Uh, there's this ugly looking uh, gap there. You have to introduce S equals zero somewhere for the numerics. So we leave a little hole to know where we are. Uh, but I mean, that's nice. And so that's a nice, a nice tight thing. But I said, I wanted to show for you um, uh, features of it. So now the point about the ideal trefoil is every point, well, I, so, I mean, this is the center line. And so the, and the radius was when things started to touch, but visually I can take the radius away and the center of the, the knot is now that knife edge corner. Okay. And the point is, so I told you that one of the necessary conditions was that the global radius of curvature function had to be constant or straight. So in these ideal trefoils, the global radius of curvature function is, is constant, well, actually it's constant and minimal. And it's constant and minimal twice, if that makes any sense. Because in point of every point on this center line there, there's a doubly critical chord going to one point there. And then there's another one which goes over here. So this is a constant width ruled surface. Uh, and you know, uh, on that knife edge, two of the rulings touch. It is not developable, right? But that's the, and in fact, in some sense, it may, probably makes more sense if I show you the mesh. So that's the mesh of all the, con so these are the contact cords there, and then you triangulate it so you can draw it. And uh, if I go see all those little dots and stuff, that's the bi arcs. <laughs> In fact, these are the, the, the red dots are the point tangent points, and then the blue points are the matching points. And you get like this gorgeous, gorgeous surface. I mean, I can still look at this for hours. <laughs> I think it's just great. Uh, 
not to be too biased or anything. Okay, so <clears throat> that's the first thing. So inside this ideal trefoil shape, there is this beautiful uh, surface in 3D that's made up by all the contact cords, right? It's a one parameter family of constant length lines that sweep around and they have the property that both ends of the lines are on the, the knot and the family as you sleep along, the tangent is perpendicular there, the tangent is perpendicular there. And it's, this is, so this is what I call the contact surface for the trefoil knot. Uh, and uh, maybe we don't agree on lots, but I think we can agree that it's pretty. Uh, okay, so that's a visualization. And now, actually, I think I won't go into full, right? so that's that. So the, the demo worked. So now I don't need to show you the slide. So that's just a snapshot of the 3D. The knife edge is the center line of the knot. And each point on the center line, uh, actually, no, why don't I, I'll go back, actually, I'll go back up to the full screen mode. Okay, so there we go. And- May I ask uh, a question? Sure. Um, yeah. Is there anything more known about this surface? Does it minimize some sort of energy? Nothing, nothing. Okay. That's very cool. Thank you. It is. <laughs> so, <laughs> I agree. But no, I mean, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, um, well, I should, I mean, okay. I mean, of course, it's a difficult question. The precise statement is, I know nothing more about <laughs> that surface. Yeah, that's, I don't, that's I'd what be I'm very, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be very surprised if anyone else did. Uh, and I mean, and it's only known numerically and, you know, uh, yeah. Okay. So, but it's very pretty, right? So that's nice. Yeah. Okay. But now it's got some magical stuff. So now what's the contact? So that's it. So that's the set of contact cords, right? It's all the doubly critical cords and you sweep around the curve and there's two of them at every point and you generate this surface. So where do the tubes touch each other? So the tubes touch each other at the middle of all the contact cords, you see, because now, uh, okay, and so uh, uh, there's this surface, this, I've now turned it yellow, so uh, it's kind of, it's sometimes hard to imagine it, right, so there's this line here, and then you put a red dot at the midpoint, and then as the surfaces sweep around, the midpoints sweep around, and they make a curve, and guess what, that's another trefoil knot, so it depends how much you can eyeball that, but I claim that it's quite easy. Actually, it's, it's, it's very interesting. In this color code, that looks as though it's the triangle that you hit to make it play the, play the movie. It's not, it's just the hole in the trefoil. So what there is, is you start from the midpoints of the uh, contact cords, and then there's a homotopy. You just move out to the edge, and then you get to the knot. And so every one of these different colors is a closed curve on the contact surface. And instead of splitting the contact cords in half, you, you know, you go to six tenths, seven tenths, march out. And then because of that homotopy, you know that that contact curve is a trefoil because you homotopy it to a trefoil knot and you can, I mean, yeah, you can see that there's no self intersections and you can also prove it. Um, uh, actually, Henrik Gerlach had proofs of that. But now that's maybe not so obvious so now we further live dangerously and I open this and I think it's that one. Ah, can't see that one yet. Go away. That's secret. <laughs> That's the wrong movie. Uh, let me, uh, open file. Oh no, I want open recent. Sorry, 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 sorry. Where the system is cracking. Uh, Open recent homotopy, this guy. There we go. So that's that yellow surface. So now this is just an animation of the homotopy. And you just slide these guys along to the end. And that is, quote, the proof. Well, I mean, there's lies, damn lies, statistics, and visualization. But nevertheless, I claim this is a proof that the contact curve is, in fact, another trefoil knot. Uh, how are we doing on time? Not very well. Okay, so I won't let you watch that again. Uh, but now we're done with that. Okay, so then we go up here.
How long is the talk? 50 plus. Uh, ah, in that case, we're doing great. You want to watch the movie again? <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. No, uh, do you? Well, ask at the end. Oh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay, so that's fine. Okay, good. Uh, all right, so then, so, so I mean, initially I said, that's weird. Why should it be a trefoil knot? Actually, if you think about it, why not? But anyway, okay, fine. So that's the contact set in 3D. But now you can also, uh, well, there's various plots here. Actually, I'll start with this one. So the first statement is the necessary condition was that the global radius of curvature condition was constant. So that's that red line. Now, if you've ever done any numerics, you can show anything is constant by picking the right scale, right? <laughs> Just make the scale. Right. So, but in the same plot, this is the radius of curvature function for this. This is the classic radius of curvature function, right? And it hovers around, uh, uh, actually, I'm surprised that's not, oh no, that should be like, oh, that's, let me not look at scales. That's the rate, because there's a weird scaling, I think, in this data. But this constant level, it's the outside loops, where there's the big, it looks like a pizza cutter, right? But then as you go through the center of the knot, all kinds of weird stuff happens. And you get really dips in the, you get the, the local radius of curvature goes very, very low, and it nearly goes down to here. So this plot is a zoom of that plot, and that blue guy is that blue guy, okay? Now, of course, it's numerics, so you have to decide what constant is. So you introduce a tolerance. This is like basically 10 to the minus five, da, 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 da. You can really see these are where local curvature equals the tube thickness. And it appears here that there's, say, six. So in fact, this is one place where the Peransky, the Prezibyl Peransky data is significantly better than ours. What these, these guys come down and they touch. And actually, local curvature also hits the normal injectivity radius at apparently isolated points. Uh, OK, so I gave time myself 45 minutes, but that's fine. OK, so that's OK. But this is the thing I really want to show you more. So now I have these pairs of contact cords, right? And those are lines in 3D. But they come from one value of arc length, and they go to another value of arc length. So this is two copies of arc length. And every point here is uh, um, it's the two values of arc length at two ends of a cord. And it, this is a doubly periodic. So those guys there are the periodic extension of this. That's the periodic extension of that, right? And you get this double valley, things, things like this. And so uh, uh, this is the contact set, which tells you which value of arc length interacts with which value of arc length, okay? And in particular, the way to read that is I could say, okay, I'm interested in S equals 0.7. And then I go along and then I read the value here and I read the value there. And those are the two values, two other values of arc length, which give me the two chords. And uh, it's interesting because this graph gets incredibly horizontal, right? So if you slice it horizontally, it looks as though this is very badly sampled, but it's not. It's because these lines are very, very nearly constant. And that's big arcs of circles. One value of arc length basically stays the same. And then the other, it sweeps out something that's very, very close to a circle. But now I was waxing lyrical about bi arcs. The, I mean, this is a plot on a continuous function. You say that hole is too big, I can compute it, right? I mean, I, I can sample that function as, as finely as you like. This is not a node node computation or anything, right? I mean, these are continuous functions, and I've chosen how much to sample them. But I claim it's pretty clear in the eyeball, famous eyeball metric, that you have these double lines. Okay, good. So, uh, so I started off with some mathematics, some hand waving about existence, I then did numerics. Okay, mathematically, ideal closed trefoil knots close to reality. So everything I've shown up to now is, I guess, at least five years old. Probably more of it is more of 10 or 15 years old. 10 or 15 days ago, 
we stuck this article on the archive, right? This is the mechanics of open and closed trefoil knots. And Pedro Rice is an experimentalist and he showed up at APFL. It's like amazing. I'm sitting here, I haven't worked on it. This guy shows up and he wants to do experiments on knots. And he's in the building next to mine. Paul Johans and Paul Grand Georges are mainly the uh, experimentalists. Uh, one's a student, one's a postdoc. Tomohiko is another postdoc. Uh, Changya Back is uh, up until about a month ago, he was a PhD student. And now I have to be careful how I phrase this. He was a PhD student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And the point is that there are finite elements and there are finite elements. So I'm now going to show you finite element simulations done by Chung Yub uh, of uh, an ideal trefoil, but as a 3D elastic body. And the point is the way those simulations are done is uh, inside Abacus. So you're making choices inside Abacus, right? So now Abacus, they build airplanes with it. It's not that bad, but it's maybe not going to pass the muster of real uh, detailed convergence tests uh, by math mathematical finite element methods. But they're nevertheless, they're very nice simulations, but whatever. But you see, it's interesting. Um, Anyone who knows me says I'm not an experimentalist, so you can't blame me for the experiment. Finite element is another sort of issue. In fact, uh, you may some people may have noticed, I would really like to hire somebody to work on finite element of knots. There's an ad came out uh, in any day in a digest uh, earlier this week. Okay, but now so now I have to tell you what this is. So now lies, damn lies, statistics and visualization. Okay. So this is a picture, as in a photograph, of a polymer rod, and it's it's quite a squishy material. I mean, if you took it in your fingers, you know, you can squish it, right? It's a 3D elastic material. There's certainly centerline stretch, and there's certainly cross-section deformation. So Chung Yeo does the finite element simulations, and that's an exam example of the finite element simulation. So eyeball metric means nothing but they look close so here's the deal this looks like it's some really cool computer visualization it's data it's experimental data <laughs> they have 3d x-ray volume imaging okay and that's i mean that's experimental data for this knot okay and you can look inside it so i'll explain that a little bit more in a second but now I want to describe this curve. So again, these are now like the 3D, uh, oh, that's probably a bit better. Those are the, did that get bigger on everybody else's screens? Yes, okay, so yeah. So here, uh, this is now like the center line and yeah, yeah. so let me talk, talk about that. Ah. If that's not a good Zoom, somebody please interrupt, okay? But now this, um, a trefoil has, period three symmetry, and then the Z's coming out. So it makes sense to actually look to plot uh, cylindrical coordinates. So these are the cylindrical coordinates of three different ideal trefoil knots. So black is ideal. It's the data I showed you, right, for the line contacts. Uh, blue is experiment. And dashed is finite element, but 3D finite element. And so those curves, um, that's interesting. See, to an experimentalist, they say, oh my God, that's incredibly good. And I think it actually is. Now, there could be a slight phase problem. You might want to fit that better. And truth in advertising, the arc lengths are different because this experiment is quite it's stretchy. So there's an overall uniform scaling to match the arc lengths of the ideal knot with the experiment and the finite element. So there's a fudge factor in there, but there's only one scalar fudge factor. And you see this, the problems here could be that there's non-uniform stretching or stuff like that. Okay. So then this now is the radial coordinate. So that's the radial coordinate as you go around. And so now the ideal is noticeably different. And what's happened is that the, uh, uh, both the experiment and the finite element, they're further out. Okay. 
that's the message I want you to get. But the experiment and the finite element are still very close, but they're noticeably different from the ideal. But I mean, of course, you know, this is real material. It's elastic, right? I mean, there's for sure elastic energy. There's deformation of cross sections and stuff like that. It's like amazing it's that close. I mean, ideal knots are perpendicular, rigid, non -formative. This is now a plot of the curvature. And uh, actually, I apologize. One of them was radius of curvature, and one of them is curvature. This is curvature. So troughs, very low radii of curvature is high uh, uh, curvatures. So these are the, the black is the ideal. And then the, the dashed and the blue is the experiment and the finite element. Lo and behold, close to unrelated. Okay. Uh, but then why should it be, right? I mean, these are rapid changes in curvature. These guys have an elastic energy, but they, I mean, I mean, there's an overall period three pattern. They're sort of the same value here, but I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not a good fit, right? But this is the 2D contact set and the black curves are the ideal contact set, which I showed you before. It's also a little unfortunate. I showed it to you uh, and the, the, the diagonal was going that way and they chose to plot the diagonal going this way, but okay. So the black lines are the double curves, which were the two arc lengths of the line contact in the ideal trefoil. And on top of that, uh, they've now split it. So this is FEM, con no, actually that's FEM contact. And this is experimental contact. So now what does contact mean? So in finite element, you know, there's like a button you press in Abacus. And so this is a surface patch element that is intersecting another surface patch element or touching it, right? So that's a different notion of contact, but it's just stunning. It just fattens out the lines. Right? Now the finite element, I have some reservations about. It's not clear to me, as well, but the experiment, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. You just have this patch. Okay, so now, uh, all right, so now let's now go look at the 3D uh, contact set. So now I want to now talk a little bit more about this experiment. So what they do is they see contrast. So this micro CT, uh, I mean, basically they put this thing in a machine, they take lots of slices, the stuff that comes out is voxels, and in each voxel there's a density of the material that's there. Okay, so air is one thing, uh, the, the polymer is another thing, but then they can change the densities. So they put a higher density uh, plast polymer in the center, the undeformed center line. So they can also see the center line of the material. And more than that, they can put a high density surface coating. So they can see when the surface touches itself. And this is touch as in touch. So that's the blue. This is now the, this is now the 3D contact set. So in the ideal knot where cross sections were rigid and stuff, we had this trefoil knot and it was lines of contact. So that's been smeared out and you now get a ribbon. So this is the contact set like that. And this is a joke. You look at that and you immediately see it's a one and a half turn Mobius band, right? And it turns out one and a half turn Mobius bands have a trefoil knot as their edge. Okay, so I couldn't see that in a million years, but I knew about the homotopy argument for the, uh, the ideal knot case. So I told them to go make a homotopy movie. So they did, but you have to understand this is a movie on experimental data. Okay, so here's the, this is a still. And for example, the guy has to cut it and stick it together. So you can see there's a little ridge where he sticks it together, right? But now, so now it's true, there's, there's image processing, right? Because they have to take this voxelated 3D data and uh, put surfaces, but it's all like MATLAB routines, right? So now you play the movie. So here's the micro CT reconstruction of the elastic closed trefoil knot, right? So you get the material center line, it's denser, you get the contact surface. That's now the blue contact surface. And then what they do is they put the edge and they're now gonna do a homotopy 
from the edge of that contact surface out to the center line of the knot. I think that, well, they don't like the word homotopy, they say morph. I guess it's Terminator 3 homotopied to another Terminator, right? But, and there you go. And uh, I, frankly, I f almost fell off my chair when I saw that. I mean, because, uh, you know, that's not too bad as a computer simulation. It's bloody experimental data. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So there you go. And so um, the chairman will be happy to learn that the next slide is the last slide. <laughs> uh, my conclusions and perspectives. So that ideal closed trefoil, I mean, to me, well, I mean, you know, it's not, well, it'd be suspicious if it were really good. I mean, and so, I mean, why should the curvatures match? Because, I mean, the ideal trefoil is completely flexible, but the contact sets are giving a remarkably accurate skeleton of a real closed trefoil, right? And again, so now I believe you should understand more or less what I mean by a contact set. Uh, and you might or might not agree with me, but understanding all these knots is understanding the contact set and then you're done. I didn't show you the data, but in the article I cited, they do the same thing for open trefoils. I mean, the main motivation for these experiments is to improve surgical knots. And so it's real world knots, it's not mathematical knots like that. Um, so if you, it's on archive, if you want to go have a look at it. Of course, we're not gonna run out of knots to study. It might be slightly boring once you've done the 279th case, but you know, there's lots of stuff to do. I would conjecture that if you added center line bending and twisting energies to an undeformable cross-section model, you would observe these discrepancies in curvature plots. And hopefully I'll have a chance to talk about that more with uh, uh, Philip Reiter and Surin Bartels, because I suspect their model must already be starting to see this, I would guess. I mean, they have a slightly different repulsion model, but they have the bending stiffness in it like that. Um, to go and do surgical knots or real knots, you need to include friction. <clears throat> and so uh, the thing now is that uh, we actually, so with Pedro Rice, we actually submitted two articles within a week of each other. The other one is ideal knot computations, but with friction. Uh, and that actually builds on even older work of me and Keller. It's like, actually it started 35 years ago. Right. And, and for the people at the conference, uh, there's a session to discuss friction in knots tomorrow afternoon. And I'll start that off with showing the, the experimental data for these things. Right. And then just as a personal statement, I mean, um, I, mean, it, I mean, I started off the talk with saying I started working on ideal knots because of this application in DNA. I just like thinking that some connection to physics. But now with this data, it's just amazing. I mean, for me, it just makes going back to looking at these ideal knot shapes and things much, much more attractive for me, things like that. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to take questions. <laughs>